The cocaine warning to Kate Moss. Britain's top policeman says it's time to get tough with celebrities who take the Class A drug. If we have uh, uh, an allegation which is so visible to the public, uh, with a person who is such a role model, then it seems to be only appropriate for the police service would investigate that. Welcome to a special ITV Evening News. All this week, as part of the programmes to mark our 50th birthday, former presenters are rejoining the team. And tonight, it's Martin Lewis. Good evening. Also on tonight's programme, the killer off the coast. A million people are told to get out of Houston as fears about Hurricane Rita grow. Kennedy on the ropes. Threats of a mutiny at the Lib Dem conference. And... Underneath there. People can often see rafts running out there and uh, that they can sometimes go in up that ramp over there and into the classrooms. Pupil Power, the children who made a documentary to expose their shoddy school. Good evening. She's losing modelling contracts worth millions and now she could even face criminal charges. If the supermodel Kate Moss had any illusions about the situation she's in over her alleged cocaine use, they were rudely dispelled today. Two big names in the fashion industry, Burberry and Chanel, announced they intend to drop her. But there was worse. Britain's top policeman, the Metropolitan Commissioner, Sir Ian Blair, said she could face a criminal investigation. He also revealed he thought it had been a mistake to let other celebrities off with a caution when they had been caught in possession of the Class A drug. Keir Simmons reports now on Kate Moss's trouble with drugs. Kate Moss is not the first celebrity to be accused of taking cocaine. But tonight, are the police preparing to make an example of her? Richard Bacon lost his job as a Blue Peter presenter after he admitted to snorting cocaine. John Leslie, the former This Morning presenter, was photographed taking the drug and publicly apologised for the embarrassment it caused his family. And Daniela Westbrook gained tabloid notoriety when a newspaper showed the septum of her nose had disintegrated after a reported drug habit. But the news that Kate may be prosecuted has shocked people in the fashion industry. It must be the worst thing that could possibly have happened to her in her whole life. Asked about Kate Moss today, the head of the Metropolitan Police said this. If we have uh, uh, an allegation which is so visible to the public uh, with a person who is such a role model, then it seems to be only appropriate that the police service would investigate that. This is a Class A drug and these are pretty serious allegations made by a tabloid newspaper. You can't be passive and allow these things to carry on without you making a stand. And the media hubbub has increased the pressure on the police to do something about it. Today, Chanel became the second fashion label to dump Kate Moss. They said simply they do not intend to use her after her current contract runs out. And tonight, Burberry announced they are now cancelling a planned advertising campaign with Kate Moss. People who know the model say her health and the custody of her daughter are both now at risk. What she needs right now is help. And she needs to be surrounded by people she can really trust. Do you think she even wants that help, though? I think deep down she must want that help. She's got a, a two-year-old daughter who's about to celebrate her third birthday. That surely must be one of the chief priorities in her life. But for now, she will be very worried about comments from the head of the Metropolitan Police. He says he thinks in the past they were wrong to simply caution celebrities accused of taking cocaine. Keir Simmons, ITV News. So Ian Blair's comments came after he made a speech to senior police officers today. And it wasn't the only controversial subject he touched on. He also suggested that soldiers could be used by chief constables to work as firearms officers after just a small amount of basic training. Well, I'm now to our UK editor, John Ray, at Scotland Yard. John, what exactly did he say about using the military? Well, Britain's top copper also has a reputation as being an astute player of the political game, Martin, so we must assume that he meant what he said and said what he meant. Now, this was in a wide-ranging speech about the police facing up to the threats of the future and the threats of now, including terrorism. And as part of that speech, he implied uh, that Britain's biggest police force might need military reinforcement. 
Could we bring staff directly in from the armed services, to use that just as an example, give them a small amount of basic training and then clear instructions as their role uh, on firearms duty so that they're partially warranted on a fixed term contract only to do those duties? The question about all of that then becomes only how bold we want to be. Well, too bold for some, it was only a matter of minutes before the people here rushed out a correction or a clarification, as they called it, uh, insisting that this was only about retired army personnel coming into the police and saying that it has absolutely nothing to do with hiring soldiers for use on London streets. Is it controversial for him to be saying this? Well, it is a very sensitive time for him to be talking about this kind of subject matter. We are midway through the investigation into the shooting dead of Jean-Charles de Menezes. That investigation will report shortly. We know that the people who fired the trigger that killed him were police officers, but one of the people involved in the surveillance team was an army man on secondment to the police, and that surveillance team may get some of the blame. But I think also, Martin, we have to be realistic in these days of heightened terror threats. We know that the army and the police work hand in glove. We know that the SAS take part in police operations. But at the bottom line of this, at the end of the day, critics say we're talking about two organisations with two different cultures. The police are here to protect, the army are there to kill. John, thanks very much. Now, at first there were mutterings, now it's growing into a roar of right disapproval. Charles Kennedy's leadership of the Liberal Democrats is under fire tonight like never before. <laughs> On the day before he gives the speech that's supposed to be the highlight of his party's conference, he's been having to defend himself from tough criticism from inside his own party. Well, our political editor Tom Bradby has been talking to him today. Tom. Well, you know, the interesting thing about this conference to me is there is a very dynamic, young, ambitious group of MPs here now who want, frankly, to push the party in a different direction, want to make it look more like a party of power. Now, they're pretty frustrated with Charles Kennedy, and it was those concerns that I put to him this morning. I asked him whether really he was a leader on the ropes. He was once soaked with sweat during a conference speech was forced to deny that he had a drink problem. I certainly do not have a drink problem, no. And he was lost for words during one of the most important policy launches of the election campaign. You're talking in the region of 20... 20, 20 yeah, yeah. And now, again, here, this week, Charles Kennedy has been taking a lot of flack. You heard from your own delegates on the floor there, one of them saying that he talked to people on the doorstep and people knew what a leader was and it wasn't you. And you must also have heard the reaction to that particular unsuccessful parliamentary candidate. But it's the kind of talk, as you well know, yeah. that has dominated the bars this week. Well, I wouldn't accept that, actually. I think that it's much better to look at the response to my measured reply to that disappointed candidate and the response was overwhelming and it's supportive. People talk about you, they say, fantastic guy, but in all honesty, what they say is fundamentally lazy, disorganised and not a leader. We've got the front page of the Liberal magazine. That says what a lot of delegates are thinking, that you're fast asleep on the job. Well, actually, I think that none of that could be true and delegates wouldn't be thinking that, given that we've arrived at this conference and I've arrived as leader, with the largest Liberal representation in Parliament in over 80 years. But that's, now, the, that's the whole point, isn't it? It should be a celebration, but it feels like a wake out there. I don't think it feels like a wake at all. And if you talk to the hundreds of delegates that I've talked to over the course of the week, they're finding these policy debates and being involved in the policy development very worthwhile. But what they're talking about this morning is the leadership issue, because you're there in black and white in every newspaper. I'm not a leader. I've admitted it. I haven't done a good well, job. I, Let's face it, what the print press choose to say and the way... Well, that's what you said in response to your right. own speechwriter criticising you. I said nothing of the sort. I said that there are times when you have to be consensual and you have to take colleagues with you in a consensual managerial way. Then, of course, when it comes to big issues, having talked with people, having got them on your side, you lead. Would you support cutting your policy of a 50p top tax rate? We're reviewing the tax rate policy, and we will come back in a year's time having taken that view. But that, that's, what the, that's the difficulty here, though, isn't it? People don't know what you stand for. What, what, what about local income tax? Where I'll are you going you, I'll tell you what, people, I'm strongly in favour of local income tax. That's not up for review.
This has been a week of hard questions for Charles Kennedy as to exactly where his tram is going. Well, Tom Brave is actually at the conference with our chief political correspondent, Daisy McAndrew. Now, um, Tom, first of all, what did you make of what Charles Kennedy had to say there? Well, I mean, I think, to be honest, he was getting pretty fed up with the line of questioning, as you probably could tell. I mean, I think he's got sick of the way the press coverage has gone this week. But in a sense, it doesn't much matter what I think. It really is more important what the delegates think. Daisy's been talking to them all day. What do you think they'll make of what they heard there? I'll tell you what I found interesting chatting to them today was they told me when they arrived here on Sunday in Blackpool, they were actually quite depressed. I think most of us in the media thought they'd be quite chuffed with their election result. They said, no, the election result was not good enough, particularly given the unpopularity of the other parties. So they started to think, is Charles Kennedy a good enough leader? He's a really popular man. You won't hear them saying a bad word about his personality but is he dynamic enough is he energetic enough they were saying to me is he perhaps a little bit lazy no not at all i think he's very dedicated to the job i think the, the public actually do like him a lot he's not lazy um but he's he's more laid back and that could have come across in that way to some people some possibly charles himself could do more but possibly the team around him could do more to thrust him forward there's been an awful lot going on over the summer and he hasn't really been up in the um, up in the news and um, and on the and on the news as much as, as perhaps member, members of the party would like. So they thought he had a bad summer, and that interesting is what the MPs have been saying to me as well. Some very senior MPs have been bending my ear today about Charles Kennedy's poor performance over the summer. In fact, they were talking about his reshuffle. They said he totally screwed it up, that he did it from home, and that that concerned them, that they thought perhaps he wasn't on top of his game. I mean, I guess we should make the point here that we're not talking about a new leader, are we? I mean, the one thing that is clear here is that people aren't hankering after a new leader for the simple reason that they think that if it came to a vote, they'd get someone from their point of view much, well certainly from the point of view of the modernisers, someone much less palatable than Charles Kennedy. So that is the real difficulty. And I guess a lot of it is going to be about what they're going to hear in the speech tomorrow. We expect he'll talk about Iraq because of course he believes that's his strong suit where he set out uh, a point of principle. What else do you think the delegates will want to hear well, though? as you quite rightly said, they definitely don't want to hear any more right-wing policies as they hear them. They want to hear more traditional liberal policies, more civil liberties. They want to hear him talk about terrorism. They want to hear him say, as Mark Oaten said today, no more black Bank checks when it comes uh, to getting rid of our civil liberties. All right, Tom Bradby and Daisy McAndrew, thank you both. Britain and Iraq deny today that relations between them had soured because of the worsening situation around Basra. The Defence Secretary John Reid and the Iraqi Prime Minister met in London today to discuss events surrounding the arrest and rescue of two British soldiers. In Iraq, meanwhile, there have been anti British protests on the streets of Basra. America is worried. This is Hurricane Rita, and it's shaping up to look just like the last storm of death to hit the Gulf Coast, Katrina. And it's getting closer by the hour. After skirting the Florida Keys, Rita's now heading across the Gulf, growing in strength every day. It's a Category 4 hurricane now, just like Katrina at the same point a month ago. That means winds of up to 130 miles an hour. It's racing through the Gulf, and as you can see from its projected path, it's expected to hit the Texas coast on Saturday and could swamp areas like New Orleans, still recovering from Katrina. From America, Robert Moore reports on the approaching menace. Wherever Hurricane Rita strikes, it cannot be said this time that America is ill-prepared. You should begin to leave the island now. Many parts of the Gulf Coast have gone on to a war footing, military and civilian preparations gathering pace by the hour. So too evacuations. The mayor of Houston announcing that those living in low-lying parts of his city should also consider leaving. Rita strengthens into a Category 4 hurricane and is now storming across the Gulf. Despite sophisticated tracking technology, no one can know where Rita will make landfall, and that unpredictability adds to the sense of dread. But Galveston, Texas, is the city that could be in the line of fire, a community that a century ago was flattened by a monster storm that was one of the worst natural disasters in American history. Today, concern is acute, especially after Katrina just three weeks ago. We will never, ever stay through another hurricane as long as I live. Never. Someone else who has learned the lessons of Katrina is the president himself. To that storm, he reacted late and at first seemed to care little. 
This time, Mr. Bush is at the forefront of those who are issuing dire warnings. We hope and pray that Hurricane Rita will not be a devastating storm. But we got to be ready for the, for the worst. Simulations show what that could mean if Rita strikes Galveston, an exposed port city and oil terminal that could be severely flooded. As Louisiana and Mississippi struggle to cope with the aftermath of Katrina, is it really possible this coastline is about to be hit by a storm of similar magnitude? In 48 hours, we will find out. Robert Moore, ITV News, in the United States. Let's get uh, some more of tonight's news now. One of the failed London bomb suspects is being brought back to Britain from Rome in the next few days. Hussein Osman is accused of trying to blow up a tube train at Shepherd's Bush. He'll be arrested and charged when he arrives back, possibly as early as tomorrow. And the jurors in the cockle pickers trial have visited Morecambe Bay, where at least 21 Chinese cocklers drowned last year. Five people are on trial in connection with the deaths. They deny the charges against them. Now, falling masonry, bad drains, blocked toilets, no heating, rats. It sounds like a disused building unfit for human habitation, doesn't it? But actually, in fact, incredibly, it's a school where hundreds of children are having to have their lessons. And so distressed have those children become, they've made an extraordinary complaint directly to the government. They did it by making a film and handed it to the school's minister himself. Philip Ray Smith has seen the school in Walsall and the children's video evidence. Don't mess with the students of the Joseph Leckie Technical College in Walsall. They got so angry about the bad state of their school that they decided to do something about it. It looks horrible, it's horrible to work in, and it just creates an atmosphere in the classroom. You can't be cheery and happy about doing your work when it's so dull and depressing looking. They made this DVD themselves, and when schools minister Lord Adonis visited the area, they ambushed him and presented him with it. Please help us and our fellow pupils. Our education is in your hands. Mark, tell us what's the main problem here with the brook? Um, well, the uh, problem is that there's um, lots of rats living in the uh, brook, and they're uh, not scared the people anymore because um, they're so used to us, and they're spreading diseases. This is one of the toilet blocks, and you can see the kids have a point. There's no glass in the skylight up there. That lets the rainwater in. It means the wooden frame is rotting. It smells in here. In fact, it stinks. And the damp has even managed to penetrate the wall. Peeling away the plaster, there have to be structural concerns for the place. These pictures seem to have had the desired effect because they've secured a meeting with Education Minister Jackie Smith next month. You must be quite proud of them. I'm really proud of them. We, we've had a college council since I came to, came to the school, so I can't take any uh, of the credits. And, and we, we do give youngsters a lot of responsibility where they can show that they can handle it. So in our media savvy era, this is direct action for the 21st century. It might seem a great length to go to, but the students hope it will earn them a new school building. Philip Ray Smith, ITV News, Walsall. Well, let's get to a reminder now of tonight's top national and regional news. The supermodel Kate Moss was warned today that she could be prosecuted over her alleged use of cocaine. Britain's top policeman, Sir Ian Blair, controversially suggested today that former soldiers could be used to work as armed police officers. And the Lib Dem leader, Charles Kennedy, defended his position today as questions grow about whether or not he's an asset or liability for his party. And our top stories tonight, the jury in the trial of five people charged after the Morecambe Bay dis cockle disaster visit the scene where 21 people lost their lives. And the latest tool in the fight against vandals, Merseyside police want the public to catch the culprits on camera. Now, of course, it's our 50th birthday this week, and it's been a great honour to have Martin Lewis here helping us to celebrate. How long has it been, then, since you worked at ITN, Martin? Mary, it's been 20 years since I worked at ITN. It is as though I haven't been away, <laughs> and with the help of the ITN archive, we put together a rather inter interesting reminder of uh, some of the stories that I was involved in. I always seem to be late into the studio to be wired up with earpiece and microphone. Good evening. 
Northern Ireland's I was very lucky in being able to combine newscasting with general election presenting. Other hot news and election stories from around the country will be monitored and filtered here at our special general election news desk. And report on stories as diverse as the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of York. I'm just about, if I can sneak through the police lines here, I'm going to try and catch a word with some of the people who have been walking up the mall. Good afternoon, madam. You've got a very small girl here. Let's see. What and the Vietnamese boat people. It beckons from out of the Sapphire Sea like a lush and beautiful valley high. It is, in reality, one of mankind's supreme insults to itself. Here at the foot of the steep slopes on a mere 40 acres of habitable land live, if you can call it that, no less than 42,000 Vietnamese refugees. Despite the considerable efforts of the United Nations, the overriding impression from this island is of a people who have come to terms with humiliation and whose lives are rotting away every bit as quickly as the wreckage of the boats that brought them here. Can I hold it? Of course you can hold it, my sweetheart. Thank you. But the story that touched me most was the Duchess of Kent visiting the world's first hospice for terminally ill children. Tears and smiles walk side by side. Bereavement and happiness walk side by side so often. It's extraordinary. Very moving pictures. Have you enjoyed yourself? You tempted to come back to broadcasting? Having seen that story again and been reminded of what it's all about, yes, I am tempted to come back, but I'm, I have to say, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, very happy working in the world of business, Mary, but great to be back for a day. Yeah, it's lovely to see you again. Thank you, Martin. That's it from us here, but I'm going to do, or rather Martin's going to be over on the uh, news channel in a few moments to answer your calls and any emails that you might have, and I'm back tomorrow evening. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Real pleasure. Bye-bye. Of course, got to keep working. <laughs>